Hey, uh, this is Jason Ines again. I'm doing a live, another live feed demo uh, inking. While we're talking, if I seem like I'm not going to look at the camera for a while, it's because I'm going to be sharing links to book and stuff. I didn't want to, I, I had the link out on Twitter. I don't want to be sitting there um, forever. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah, I'm going to be uh, sharing it really quickly to the few venues I do share it to, which is mostly um, digital webbing, Twitter, and Facebook. And so I'm getting that set up. The main purpose of this is because I'm doing a live demo. I've never even tried it. You can see the brush. This is Raphael 8408. Sorry, 8404. I'm going to change my name on that. Um, on uh, Twitter and stuff, I got it in the wrong thing, but 8404. It's a uh, sable, Kalinsky sable brush, which makes it great for inking. That's when the brush, the br bristles keep the shape better when they're Kalinsky sable. They're cut off, I think, the tail of a mink. <laughs> so I don't think they have to kill the mink or anything, thank goodness. I can just trim a little bit of hair off of it. But it's a really fine hair for keeping the brush, uh, the shape of the brush. Now, I have an old Windsor & Newton Series 7 that um, it's kind of seen better days. You can see it's kind of the bristles. I don't know if you can see it really well. Uh, the camera sometimes can't focus that close. But it's starting to get a few hairs that are getting out of place. And I thought maybe I'd abuse the brush and misused it. Um, but it turns out that they, the brushes do have a longevity. They don't last forever. And they start to kind of lose their shape after a time. Because, like I said, uh, Terry Moore, uh, who's, um, inks, who's a comp, uh, artist who works on a couple projects of his own, uh, since Strangers in Paradise came out, which was his Eisner awarding, awarding comic, he's used about 30 different Raphaels and Windsor Newton Series 7s. 30 over 20 years, has, and I've only used one over the last year and a half. That's a pretty good ratio. So it was about time I get a new brush. And I said, hey, if I'm going to try something, I'm going to get something, I'm going to try something different. Because some people say the Windsor Newton Series 7s, you get a good one, you'll get a bad one. You'll get two good ones, you'll get a bad one. Um, I got a good one. At least I think I got a good one. And um, it seems like it were, it, I mean, it went pretty well, I think. Um, I, I liked it, and it just it just started to wear out a little bit. And, again, it wasn't anything of any fault of its own. It's just it, they just have a shelf life, apparently. So it ran out. I'm keeping, the, I'm keeping my Series 7 handy just to be on the safe side. Well, again, while well, I'm getting the other links loaded up, I, I'm going to show you some of my other inking tools. Of course, there's the ink. What can you do without that? That's... Uh, Dr. P.H. Martin's Black Star ink, I like it. Uh, it's a little bit thicker than a lot of other inks, which kind of makes it gives it richer black. And it's supposed to be has less shine, and it's true because I've used other inks before, and I get kind of a sheen off of it. And I do kind of have to tweak it in Photoshop a little bit, but it's not as bad. I also have a bottle of just general run of the bill wide out. <laughs> That's your lifesaver. I've seen so many people that have inked something, and they'll have a crooked line, and they're like, why do you have a crooked line? Wide out. Oh, I can do that? Yeah, why not? Uh, Photoshop it out, whatever. Don't let people see any kind of mistakes you make. Go ahead and take them out. Also, I've got my Easter egg, <laughs> which keeps my uh, needed eraser and a regular white eraser. Never use a pink one. Always use one of these nice little white ones because they hurt your paper less. Um, the, the pink ones have a tendency to have a lot of acidic content, which degrades your paper. Also, I, for this purpose of today, I've got my blue pencils out. I went to my local art support store had them. I asked everywhere, like all the big change, like what's a blue pencil? What's a photo blue pencil? Like where it says non-photo blue pencil at top? Yeah, that's what I wanted. But I, you, you don't go to a, don't go to a big retailer. Go to a small art shop. They'll know what you're talking about. I went to the store like, you guys have got blue pencil? They're like, yeah, why won't we? Go to, go to an art store, a drafting store. Don't go to like a chain. Go to a chain for the stuff you know you want that they know they've got. But for the specialty stuff, go to an art store. Support your local art store. And they know what they're talking about. Um, the one I go to is called Suburban Paint. It is incredible. Um, so it, it's one of my favorite art stores. I've, I've been going there for like at least 15 years since I've been here in South Carolina. It's a great store. Um, as we're talking, I'm sharing a quick link to um, quick link to um, my Alice in Zombieland fan page. By the way. What I'm going to be inking is my own comic, my web comic. I'm going to get on a platform for a bit. I'm going to talk about it. Not for long. I'm not going to bore you guys. Basically, it's a web comic I made a long time ago on DeviantArt. I always say this story, but I'll, I'll be, keep it brief. Um, on DeviantArt, someone said, hey, I, I'm going to partner up with Heavy Metal Magazine, maybe do some, post a couple pictures of people's comics that they're working on. And I said, okay, what? I don't have a comic suitable for it. I don't have my own comic yet ready. So I, I created the project really quickly and never shared it to, <laughs> never shared it to, uh, to Heavy Metal. I almost had a chance to meet Kevin Eastman at uh, Heroes Con, but if you were at Heroes Con and you saw the line for Kevin Eastman, you know that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> it was around the corner to meet Kevin Eastman. Um, and so, yeah. 
mostly that. And then I got one more thing to share, and that's on new demo. This is on uh, digital webbing. Let me tell you, I've actually met people in real life that I've met here on digital webbing, and I was like, oh, neat. I met you on digital webbing. <laughs> I think it was Cat Staggs that the hero was kind of like, I know you. I've kind of seen you on digital webbing from time to time. Yay. And she was like, okay. <laughs> it was a busy time for her, though. She was selling sketches left and right. She had some beautiful sketches, beautiful sketches. That's why I follow on, on uh, Twitter. She's just got some amazing sketches. I'm like, that's a sketch? I hate my life. <laughs> I really do. I'm like, I wish I had better sketches sometimes. Oh, speaking of which, um, which I'll get to now really briefly before I get on the inking. My sketch, I did this quickly at work uh, between phone calls because I, I work at a marketing center, and so I made a quick sketch. It's just on camera. Got to hit my face. But yeah. So this is a quick sketch of cosplayer, Australian cosplayer, Eve Beauregard, and I just tagged her just to say, okay, I drew you, whatever. No, no, I didn't expect anything from it. And then she well, she retweeted it. So uh, if you, uh, thank you, Eve Beauregard, for that. Um, and, a, and a bunch of other people like favorited it, and it would happen at a really odd time, which I'll tell you in a while, what, what was going on. Um, it's a really, what is that on YouTube? So there's like really funny things on the logo of YouTube, I'm sorry, it must be some kind of event that they're doing. But I'll tell you the story why I work on the inking, but the last things I want to tell you about for the tools that I have handy, I've gone through everything else, is brush soap. Always have your brush soap handy, it's just it's especially brush soap. You can use regular soap. I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, if you're on a budget, yes. If you're not on a budget, you can afford three dollars for a cake of brush soap. Get three dollars of brush soap. Uh, you can see the ink in there. You can use this for any kind of paint. I usually have one for each style. If I've got water, well, I don't usually use it for watercolor. But I've got one for my oil paints. I've got one cake for my acrylic paints. One cake for my inking that I keep in my book bag that I take to work with me daily. I've got a lot of paper towels to dab the brush off of. Whatever. I've got some napkins handy somewhere. I usually squeeze my ink onto a paper plate. It's about time I rotated out plate, though, I think, because you know, if I squeeze ink, I won't see what the wet ink is anymore. <laughs> um, so those are dessert plates. They have them at work. No one ever uses them for anything, really. And usually I start my inking projects at work, so I wind up having to grab something. Um, I just consider it as a paper plate, a wax-covered surface. Now, I, don't, I don't know if I like styrofoam. Masking tape, if you need to secure it, something down to get a straight line. I don't really need to secure it to get a straight line, but if you need to hold it down to draw the straight line, Masking tape doesn't hurt. Always, when you use masking tape, always kind of kill the gumminess of it by sticking on your shirt. In this case, my Boba Fett shirt. <laughs> um, but so I've got that. Let me go ahead and put my Eve Beauregard drawing up there. And one quick thing before I actually do start, another quick thing. These are my pages that I'm going to be doing. I'm probably going to be doing only page four. This is page four, which is the first page that she's actually in a dialogue on, which I've been working on for a while. And this one was actually, I, I drew it as the bottom page, and then I started doing the top page, and didn't like the narrative, the way I was telling the storytelling. So I redrew it on a separate piece of paper, photoshopped it together, Frankensteined it, and then I put it and printed it out to Kinko's. And Kinko's gave me a nice print on Thursday, Wednesday? No, Wednesday evening it was. So I've only had this like two days. And I realized one tiny detail. I left, she got a tattoo on her upper upper right arm, and I think I didn't really draw it in on the second panel. So I don't know if I'm going to Photoshop that in or sketch it in with my pencil. And then this is page five if I get to it. And page five was a little bit delayed because I didn't have the perspective of the floor tiles in there right. But this is the original, this is the new version of page five. And then this is what I had before. This I started back in like March or February. That's the original page four. And this is the newly improved page four. I think my drawing skills as far as storytelling have improved, and I'm only showing that not to brag, hey, I'm getting better, but to say, guys, stick with it. Over the course of a couple months, I don't know anything about storytelling in art. I have an associate degree in fine art. I can paint. I can draw. I've got paintings up here that you guys can't see. I can paint what I see, but telling a story with it is something I never went to classes for, I never grew up doing, and I'm struggling with it. So if you're struggling with it, don't worry. I'm struggling with it. If you think my pages are great, then you know what happens with my struggling. So if I'm struggling and you think I'm good, then stick with it. Seriously, you'll get better. Um, even on the same page, <laughs> over the course of a couple of months, I got better. Um, so there's that. And I'm going to get my stuff out of the way so I can get my camera set so I can get the surface all worked out. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to probably get my pen out here. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> Didn't mean to get the Bogart drawing in the background like that. Um, Let's go ahead and see if we can bounce this down a little bit more. 
Let me go and take that down. So I'm, not that it's a problem. It's just I don't want it to be necessarily a distraction. Like it looks like she's looking over the whole page. There we go. I just wanted to show it to you. All right. Um, the problem is always getting the camera set so you guys can see what I'm doing. Yeah, let's switch it the other way around. I usually prop my camera up on a book. Well, it's my laptop. It's my webcam on my laptop. So if I prop it up on a book, usually I can get a good, pretty, good, pretty good angle on it. There we go. Um, so let me just go and put these other pages aside for right now. Because um, I'm probably going to start on this one since this is narratively the next, the next picture. I mean the next picture. The next, uh, the next piece of the story. And I'm going to probably start in an area that's not essential, just so I can get a feel for the Raphael brush. But an area I mean not, that's not essential, I mean like up here, um, because I don't know how it's going to behave. I've never, this brush literally, has, I've never even had the cap up off it. I've never even had the, the top part off of the little plastic shield they put on it. I haven't even taken that off yet. So it's still got the factory size and the brush on it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually run a line here. Whoops, back up a little bit more. Nope, the other way. <laughs> Other back up. I'm going to run a line right here so I could do the, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to start noodling around in here where it's all black and I don't need to worry about it and I just do some testing of that. Then when I get more confident with the brush, I'll start working on Allison. So, so I've just got a, I should have put this in the tags. <laughs> uh, I've got a Copic, um, Copic multi-liner. Uh, I'm using a number one here. And I'm going to just drop a quick line. Trying to make sure I'm dropping the right quick line here. Yeah, here we go. Right there. Oh, you guys aren't even seeing that. I'm sorry. There we go. Oops. That's another thing I need to get new ones is the multi-liners. I'm starting to wear, the, wear them out. <laughs> I might go ahead and pop for the more expensive uh, refillable ones, like the Rick like Copics. They make a refillable multi-liner, and I'm just like mesmerized by that idea. A refillable pen that I'll never have to fill again? Yes, please. And one little tiny line right there. There we go. And I'm probably going to do this line right here too, so it gives me a box. So now I have a box of where I can noodle around and not have to worry about where the black's going because it's going to go all inside that black. And then if I get more confident, I'll go ahead and do the boot here. <laughs> um, it probably won't even be seen because the thing is the trimming mark is right about here-ish. So you probably just see her corner of her hand reaching back and her elbow will be cut off. Or I might shrink the whole thing down and make it fit. I don't know. Um, we'll see. First thing is first, and that is it's time to actually get the Raphael 8404 on the road. I keep calling it 8408. It's 8404. And let's get that kind of going. What I, first thing I do is I got a cup full of water. So, whoops, there's a giant cup of water now. <laughs> Boy, this thing's on there good. This plastic shield's on there tight. There we go. Yeah, they got some good sizing in that. I mean, that's like stiff. You could stick something in the finger with that. I don't know if that was a wise thing to go and do that, but I always try to wet the brush first to kind of get the sizing out rather than dipping it straight into ink or something. There we go. Trying to get the sizing out. The bristles are starting to separate from the, from the center. Um, they always put this, this coating in it. I think it is called sizing, which is like, paper has it too. It's so that when you have it in the store, oh, this is beautiful. When you have it in the stores, it doesn't make any messes. 
Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> that's so beautiful having your brush again. Oh, wow. The, the, the it's It really is a nice, like, flow on it. It's got a big, fat body, too, which is kind of weird. The, the Windsor Newton had a very narrow, narrow body in the back here. Um, and this has got a really fat body and a really narrow tip, um, which is kind of a really interesting phenomenon. Um, I'd like to have one of these for my oil painting. Seriously, I haven't done oil painting in ages, but oh boy, if I did, I'd love to have one. All right, now that we got the brush up and woke up, um, I think I'll do some soap in it. The soap kind of helps condition it too. So um, this is what I always do with a new brush: soap it, wash it, you know, get it nice and clean, baby it first. Wow, this does have a nice big fat body. It's weird to have a brush with such a flat body. I know that's what I've heard. Uh, the ones are, they all have a different bowl or whatever you want to call it in the back. All right. It's very, very, very thick. Narrow tip, wide body. This might be my brush for a while. Um, it's going to be my brush for a while because I bought it and it's 13 bucks. That's another thing. These brushes are super expensive. This is like a $30 brush. I waited for it to get on Amazon for 13 So if you go online and say, wow, it's a $30 brush. How do you spend $30 on it? I didn't. There's a reason why my, my, um, my demos haven't been in a while. One was that I had dental surgery last week. So I couldn't really talk. <laughs> the other reason is it took me a while to order the brush, and it finally just came in. So um, yeah, these brushes are super expensive. <laughs> um, let me see if I can back this up a little bit so I get a little bit more room on the table. I don't have very much room to negotiate. All right, can you see that OK? Too far out. There we go. So I'm going to grab some ink and start working on this and just make some marks just for the heck of it. And then I'll start going into like stuff like her dress and stuff. The stuff like the wear me sign, I'm going to do that with pen and ruler. But stuff like her fingers and all this stuff, I'm going to do with brush. And I don't, they don't know if this is going to be like a two-hour demo, if I'm just going to do like a 20-minute, 30-minute demo. I mean, it took me 10 minutes to get set up, so I might do it at least an hour's worth. Wow, these bre these this bristles seem really kind of stiff, which is weird. I'm, it's supposed to be all black. I'm just testing the ability to hold a line. Oh, this has got a nice. That makes some beautiful spear marks. The spear marks are the ones that have the little, the, see that, how it does that little tapered point? I'm, uh, I'm sure it's got another name for it. <clears throat> I'm just right now testing the ability of the brush. Jonathan Glapiano had gotten this amazing, like, brush mark, and I'm trying to figure out how he did it. I can't figure out how he did it. <laughs> it's some kind of trick of the wrist, and I can't get it, so I'll worry about that for another time. Okay, this is basically just block it in kind of stuff, so I'm probably not going to do too much of it. Great. I'm probably going to go on to something more important. Now I've gotten this all peppered in. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it really well. I think I'm blocking my big old head. But um, the uh, Oh, let me tell you about the story then. This is a good reason because I, I can't listen to music. I, I tried listening to music softly and I had it a little too loud last time. And I lost my first video I ever did. Um, it got lost because I accidentally recorded over it. And the second video I did got muted audio about from YouTube because I listened to the radio a little too loud. So now I don't risk it because then everything I talk about gets lost. But what happened was last night, yesterday, I, I, like I said, I was at my marketing job all day. I didn't feel like doing the, I had to do floor tile corrections on Allison Zombie on page five. The perspective was off and I was like, eh, I don't feel like, I couldn't do it while I was in between phone calls because I needed a light box or a window. And I said, eh, I don't feel like doing that right now. 
so what I did was I was like, eh, let me. I always have an inbox that I, I save photos of stuff that I'm interested in. So in my inbox, I had saved a um, couple photos of a couple models, things I want to get to drawing eventually. And I said to myself, okay, I'm going to draw this draw this picture of E. Beauregard. It's a good profile. It's, it's almost a near profile. It's, it's a kind of a seven eighths view because you can see the corner of her back eye, but you don't really have her nose in profile. But it's really, it's not really quite three quarter. So it's almost profile, but not quite three quarter in between the two of them. And I suck at profile, so I said I'm going to just do profile practice. So here I am, just sketching it in my in between phone calls. I'm concentrating really hard because I got a little bit of a white line. A Copic multiliner one is having some issues. That's what I'll do. I just got paid. I'll, I'll order my multiliner refillable. Um, my one and my three are like my, my workhorse. The number, the point one and the point three Copic multiliners. And I'm almost out of Windsor and Newton ink, but I, I mean not Windsor and Newton. Ugh, not Windsor and Newton. Sorry, that's the brush. I'm almost out of this Black Star ink, and I said to myself, buy another bottle. It's cheap, so I've got, I've got two bottles. <laughs> this one, which is almost empty, and a new one. So I'm not gonna run out of ink anytime soon. Um, I'm definitely not gonna run out of ink. Well, anyway, um, so here I am drawing this drawing of Ebro Regard. In my little marketing job, and I figured, what the heck, you know? When I, I always share my drawings on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. I mean, not Facebook. I mean, not YouTube. Um, so I said to myself, okay, I'm going to tip that up a little bit. I'm not doing anything important. I'm just blocking in blacks. I said to myself, okay, I'll tag her in it because I drew it. I, whenever I do something, I always tag the person in it. Usually, nothing usually happens with it, but. Usually I'll tag it just because, okay, that isn't that person. And I let it be. I just tagged it because it was Eve Beauregard. She was the model. I tagged her in it and whatever. Walked away from my computer. It was 9-11. I'm a, if you don't know me very well or um, you haven't followed me very long, I'm a composer as well as an artist. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in music composition. And so I'm going to work on Allison's dress now too. I, so I, with my bachelor's degree in music composition, I, I love music. I mean, that is like my other passion. And so one of my favorite composers, the school of thought, is the minimalists, because minimalists embrace tonality for the most part, and a lot of modern music is just like tonality. What's that? We don't need that anymore. That's the oppression of the of the past. And the minimalists say, well, the, the tonality helps us explore other things. It gives us a framework with which to explore other like structural concerns. So they use tonality in so much as that it's the familiar language of the ear. And I do love American minimalists because they usually emphasize rhythm and it's very riffy in a sense. It's almost like you're listening to rock riffs repeated. Um, and so Two minimalist composers have written tributes to 9/11 because both of them have been around New York. Um, John Adams and Steve Reich. So John Adams' piece is on the transmigration of souls, and that's the older of the two pieces. And I only listen to it once a year. I listen to it on 9/11 every every year uh, as a memorial. And so there I am listening to on the transmigration of souls, and it's a very heartbreaking piece. Um, it, in parts, it's very beautiful and sad. So it gets to the part that always gets me. It, there's vo uh, voices singing in tight harmony, um, singing recollections of loved ones who were trying to recall the people that they loved that they lost. And it's actual quotes from real people. But John Adams doesn't exert who the people are in the music. You know, it's not like they're saying this is so and so, sing, talking about so and so. No, it's just the phrases of the loved ones talking about the loved ones that they lost. And it gets to the, that part, and there's really tight harmonies in, in the music. So the music is absolutely beautiful at that point. And so here I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm crying my brains out because it's the, it's the most important part. And I'm looking at Twitter, and I notice two notifications. And it's like, well, actually three, actually. Um, Eve Beauregard left this sweet comment about my art, and she retweeted me. And a whole bunch of people were favoring my drawing of, of her. And so I'm like grateful, but I'm bawling my eyes out because I'm listening to this piece about 9/11. I'm like, oh my gosh! So it was like a bittersweet moment that you know I was very appreciative of what you know that Eve Bowie got and shared my drawing, but at the same time I was like, 
thinking about 9-11. <laughs> it's kind of a mixed emotion. Um, because at 9-11, um, this is kind of an, an interesting personal story that will relate to what I'm doing here today. I was in art class, actually. I was in my, I was in my first semester of my associate's degree. I was enjoying one class. We were drawing vegetables in charcoal. And I always tell this story to all my Facebook people. That's why I didn't do it this year. Because um, I always say it. it was like, it's always the same story. And I'll never forget it. Um, and there was a young woman. Oh, young woman. <laughs> there was a woman, yeah. Um, and her name was Suki Reed. She was another artist. And she goes, I think the, I think somebody attacked the World Trade Center again. And we were like, what are you talking about? And then she turned the TV. And we're like, oh, that's just a replay from when it happened back in the Clinton years. And then we realized it wasn't. It was live. And everybody was shocked. Um, it's time to wash the brush, by the way. I brush the brush regularly. So that any ink that's in the back of the brush is not getting used doesn't dry out the doesn't dry on the back of the brush and ruin it. And I might sometimes I wash soap it and wash it thoroughly, and sometimes I just run it through the water just to get the loose bits out and then dab off the water. Being that's a new brush, I don't think I'll harass it too much with the soap right now. Um, and it looks like it's coming out pretty clean anyway. But anyway, um, so here I am. This is a great brush, by the way. I just want to say it's an amazing brush. The Windsor Newton Series 7 is not a bad brush either. But this one, I'm just like, wow, nice, amazing. It's really good stuff. But anyway, um, so the um, here I am crying. Here we are thinking about that something that's a replay, and it turns out it's the real deal again. And so we're all like, you know, shocked. And it just changed your world. Um, and I just think it's, uh, thinking about it yesterday when I was working on Alice in Zombie Line, thinking 13 years ago I was also working on art. And I remember thinking in a good way how the human spirit go went on. You know, um, with 9-11 it doesn't matter what happened, what, you know, who did what. What matters is, is that it affected all of us in one way or another. And the good thing was it felt like the world was over. And it clearly wasn't because here I am still doing art. You know. 13 years later. A little different world. I don't know, I think a hair fell out. Yeah, you'll get, I mean, you'll get that too, by the way. If you get a new brush, sometimes the brush hair will snap off. It's just kind of natural wear and tear. Even early this early stage, it will happen. Um, just because the brush, was, the brush was made in a factory, and sometimes it has things that are loose bits in it, like you know, contents tend to settle when shipped, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, let me see if I get some. There's a seam. I'm, I'm basically making a seam. Of her night dress. Um, by the way, if you've if you've seen followed my comic at all, you'll notice that in some of the photographs I have her in like a corset. There's two couple reasons for that. The main reason is I don't want her walking on a night dress for five or six issues. I've, I've scripted about five to six issues. It depends on how much I have left to do by the time I get to the fourth issue. If I got nothing left to do, it's, I ended at five. If I, feel like, if, if I feel like I need to do a little bit more in the story, I will do a fifth issue, uh, fifth issue before the sixth. And it's not like I don't have a plan. It's just I don't know how much stuff I'll get time to do in between the other issues. And there's some very specific things I want to do. And like I said, if I don't get to them, I'm going to go ahead and do a fifth issue before I do my sixth. I know exactly what I want to do. I have basically two ideas, an, over, an overarching plot and a, um, like a B story. And the B story is, of course, going to be woven around the A story. So if the A story is done before the B story is finished, I'm going to do a fifth issue to finish off the B story. There's a very specific thing I want to have accomplished by the time I get to the final issue. And if it's not accomplished before issue four is done, then I will make an issue five before an issue six. So it's either going to be a five-part miniseries or a six-part miniseries. Um, I know how it's going to end. I even told my wife the last panel already. Um, so, I mean, it's going to be a very specific ending. I even told my wife about the, if, if, I, if this does take off, I'm going to do a sequel. And I've already told her about the sequel and everything. And she's like, wow, you've got us all planned out. I'm like, I do. I was about ready to explode. I was like, I need to tell somebody. I wasn't going to tell the world. I'm the kind of guy that I love a surprise. Um, I don't like 
when I tell somebody a surprise, it kills the fun for me, and I don't want to do the surprise anymore. Surprise. I love surprises, though. I love playing them. I love seeing the look on the face when the, fan, the, the surprise plays out. I have, a very, I have a surprise for a friend I've planned um, that I haven't told my friend about. So that's going to be, I don't know when I'll be able to do that surprise. But it's a very specific thing I've been planning for for months. And I haven't got told anybody about the surprise because I don't want to kill the surprise. And when I kill the surprise, it makes me not want to do the, the fun anymore. This brush is really amazingly nice. Um, it might be because it's brand new. I don't remember how the Windsor Newton handled when I got it. it the Windsor Newton's not a bad brush. I'm not knocking it at all. Um, it served me well. I loved it. I do love. I still love it now. If it was newer, I'd still love it too. Um, but it's seen better days, so I've needed this brush for a while. Um, The other thing is, too, if you keep wetting it, the, the chance of having ink in the back of it drying out will be very minimum. I can get a very nice fine line with this. I'm going to have to get new inking brushes a lot more often. I should have bought, like, two of these guys and left one in the back, left one in the back you know? Like, two, please, 13 bucks a piece. Um, just so that when my other one wears out, I can just go to my closet and get the second one out. And now it sounds really vain, but it's like toilet paper. I mean, it's going to... Or, like, uh, milk. Not milk. Milk spoils, but it's like paper towels. You know, you, you, you're not, as long as you keep it in a safe place, you're not going to not use those paper towels. It's just a question of when. Same with the brush. I mean, this brush is going to last forever. It's going to eventually wear out. How soon is the question? And having one on the file, ready to go. It's like the ink. I knew I'd be using two bottles of ink. <laughs> so I had some money. I was like, eh, another bottle of ink. I had like a gift, cause gift certificate. And so I said, okay, might as well get more ink. I'm going to try doing a really fine line here, see how easy I can get it. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Um, so a little errant here. I'm wondering how I'm going to deal with him. Okay, he went back in, didn't he? Yeah, he went back in. Um, <laughs> we'll get these brush brush shows. You get to learn, you get to know your brush shows and like, get back in there. Oh, there's that straggler again, because it literally will behave the same way every time. Um, you have to get used to your brush. Each brush does have a personality. And I know some people actually go to a brush store and look at them and say, no, I don't want that one. Nope, I don't want that one. Nope, I don't want that one. And it's not like brushes that look bad, like one that looks like it's been dried out and run under behind a truck. But I mean, ones that look beautiful, then they can just look at it and go, nope, that's not one. that's not the one for me. I don't know if I ever have that. I'll ever have that skill. That seems really insanely like monkish, you know, really savant um, skill level savant beyond what I have. But we'll see. Maybe one day I'll pick up a brush and say, "No, nope, that's not the one for me." Not the past. Usually, you can tell the difference between different manufacturers. Like I said I can definitely tell the difference between how a Raphael handles versus how a I've missed having a tip like this. this. The tip on this brush is amazing. I mean, I can draw fine, fine lines. And the Windsor Newton used to be able to do it too, but, she, but like I said, uh, she, she, she wore out. <laughs> there, can a brush be a she? Is that too far up for you guys? No, you can see that stuff. But anyway, um, ooh, that looks nice. But um, what was I talking about? I got sidetracked so much. Another thing is, I've, I've said this every demo I do, but whenever you do a curved line, try to curve it so that if the curve is like an arc like this, like a rainbow, put yourself at the bottom of the rainbow. If it's a curve like this, rotate the paper so the rainbow curves back. Think of a rainbow. A rainbow doesn't curve up to the sky. It curves back to the earth. Your arm moves the same way. Don't fight the nature of your arm being able to do this. Don't go, try to make it go like this. You'll never get a straight line, or at least a, a good line. You have a much accurate sweep of the line if the curve follows it. Another thing is, too, don't, don't drag the brush toward yourself. Pull it across the paper, away from you. It's a much more natural motion and gives you a much better line.
And the exciting part about these page, this page is um, this is the first time Allison will speak in the whole comic. And I might give you guys a sneak peek of what, what the dialogue is going to be. I've never lettered a page before, side note. So I don't, I'm, I, I have horrible handwriting, so I, I'm debating whether I'm going to do it by hand or if I'm going to use a, a, a handwritten font in like Photoshop or something. But I, I'm a, I have horrible handwriting, so that's kind of a handicap for me. <laughs> it's kind of the reason why I didn't go into marine biology. Uh, I have a handicap. I don't really know how to swim well. And I know people say, oh, well, you scuba dive. It's not really swimming. Yeah, but if the scuba diving gear fails me or if I fall in the water, yeah, I kind of need to have swimming skills. So, I mean, I can swim, but I'm not really good at it. So, I decided let's not tempt fate. <laughs> let's stay away from the water. Uh, which now makes me want to watch Jaws all of a sudden. I'm just trying to feather one part of it. I don't think I meant for it to be feathered. I just want to test how well it feathers. And the Raphael feathers beautifully. Uh, side note, um, I, I, sometimes there's projects I wish I could be more involved with. A friend of mine is working with another friend of mine to write this comic or web story or TV show or whatever. He's writing as a pitch where he's going to have it like as a comic book and then pitch it. And it's an incredibly intricate sci-fi tale that doesn't emphasize the sci-fi-ness of it. In other words, it's, a, it's in science fiction. Science fiction elements abound. But it's about the people, and it's an incredible story. It truly is an incredible story. Intricate, full of twists and turns. They have a beginning, middle, and an end. It's a three-part thing, so it would be the three, like a three-run three book or a three-part movie or a three-act movie or a TV show across three seasons. In any case, it is an incredible story, and I wish I could quit everything and get paid to do it. <laughs> I mean, it is a great story. My friend unfolded for me. All the, we went to McDonald's, and he unfolded the entire thing. He's like, this is the beginning, this is the middle, and this is the end. And I was like, why don't I have more time to do this project? Why can't I just like be paid to do this? I'm inking the corset behind her right now. And wow, this Raphael, this great thin line. But um, it was what I was going to tell you about is what, you know, why a corset. I just, Victorian era dress, I wanted to be in Victorian era dress. And I debated whether or not Allison was, in fact, um, Alice Liddell from Alice in Wonderland. And I decided definitively that she wasn't. I didn't want to write a period piece. I didn't want to say that Allison, I mean, Allison, <laughs> Alice was a modern woman. I didn't want to say those things. So I said to myself, okay, the only thing I can do is to actually make a new character. And then I thought to myself, should she be period or not? And I said, no, I don't want her to be period because that's too confusing for her to draw. Because then I would have to make everything accurate. I know you don't have to, but I would feel the need to do accuracy in storyline and in characters and costuming. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. That's way too complicated for my taste. Especially if something's supposed to be fun, it would be too much work. It wouldn't be a labor of love. It would be a labor of stress. So... What I did was I said, Allison is a regular person in our modern day that liked Alice in Wonderland. So she's a regular young lady. And then I thought, okay, if it's a nightmare she can, or a dream, she can wear whatever she wants. But I don't, I don't envision a woman like her wanting to wear a corset, so I, said, I made it a situation where she has to. And plus, I don't know, the eat me thing, coup uh, coupon. <laughs> Wrong thing. Um, the eat me cupcake thing, I was just like, nah, I'll pass. That's been done so many times before. And it's not really a tale of different sizes. I don't think, I don't think I'm ever changing size at all. Because um, that's more of a Dodson thing. Dodson, uh, Dodson I always refer to the author of, Alice in Wonderland as Charles Dodson rather than his pen name Lewis Carroll. It's because I think of the man behind the story more than the pen name. Charles Dodson was a um, was a math enthusiast. So a lot of things in Alice in Wonderland have to do with 
math in general, the concepts of math, the precepts of math. One of the things is proportion, ratio. So that's why she grows and large and gets bigger and smaller in size, um, is because of the idea of ratio and balance and proportion, etc. Um, there's a, there actually actually is a part where she goes two plus two is what did you say two plus two is ten, two plus three is eleven. At this rate, I'll never get to four or something of that nature. And people have said, oh, that's so incorrect. If you look at it, though, if you use base four, which uses the numbers zero through four, much like binary uses zero and one only, base four would be zero, one, two, three. Those four numbers only, zero, one, two, and three. So at that point, four would be 10, and five would be 11, six would be 12, etc. So when she says, I'll never get to four at this rate, it's because four is not part of base four numbers. Because um, it only uses numbers zero through three. So it's actually a pun about base, number bases. Much like if she'd said, you know, one plus one is two, uh, one plus one is ten in binary. A highly sophisticated pun about mathematics, and the casual viewer might not even be aware of it, but it's a hundred percent about like the base numbers. Um, and like I said, the way I relate it to it is just think, think binary. Binary is base two. <laughs> Zero and one. So that's one of those puns that comes up from mathematics. And a lot of it has to do with mathematics. And a lot of it has to do with proper grammar lessons in England as well. Not just about card games, it's also about because a lot of the recitations she does are of are parodies of French phrases that young girls would have to recite in school. Some of them are, are, are atrocious parodies, intentionally atrocious parodies of, like I said, grammar school poem recitations and things of that nature. So you know these, you know, these young school-aged children reading, reading this book would be howling with laughter about how awfully parody these things are. They're like, oh gosh, I hate that lesson. And then Lewis Carroll here he is, comes along and writes this like hilarious parody of these things you'd be having to read in grammar school. So, and I'm about to break my one rule, which is to not curve away from yourself, and I kind of did it just then. Part of it's because the page is so far across from me. Oh, I love this brush. It's so nice. Soon I'll be doing some new Trixie pages. I've got new Trixie pages in my inbox. I just haven't had a chance to print them yet. My printer's been giving me hell. Um, some days it lets me scan stuff. Some days it doesn't. And it seems like the days I really want to print something is the days it's like, oh, yeah, we can't find the printer. It's like the printer decides to go on vacation. I'm all like, come on, printer. And yeah. So some of these things I'm not gonna do with the brush because it's straight lines, like the so the little wear me placard, the, the circle template, the the ruler, the rulers, the hangers. Um, I'm not doing those with the brush. I'm doing anything organic with the brush, her hair, her body, um, and even some clothing because it, it looks more interesting wrinkled with the, with the brush and with the pen. I have a very specific, to go, to go back to Allison in general, general, like how I make this comic, I have a very general playlist for how I see Allison in general. Like, can you see him? I think my fat head's in the way again. Um, I have a very specific playlist. I would love to tag videos and put the music I, I envision for the world in the videos, but I would get slapped with so many YouTube copyright violations. Um, like, I really envision this as having a soundtrack. Um, almost from like Danger Mouse records that he's produced, um, like the Black Keys albums, 
Um, Demon Days from Gorillaz. I, I really see like some songs from that fitting this. Um, especially like the songs Turn Blue um, from the new Black Keys album. I see that as being kind of the journeying song. Also, St. Elsewhere from uh, Niles Barkley. Uh, that kind of like psychedelic kind of psychedelic blues kind of thing. Um, I see that as being kind of the, <laughs> the sound for for Wonderland, the psychedelic kind of... It's not my favorite line in the world I just made. Um, but this kind of psychedelic uh, landscape kind of idea. I'm going to wash the brush thoroughly. It's shaping up pretty good. It makes some pretty good thin lines, too. I'm going to actually pay attention to them right instead of just half pretending. <laughs> and be like, oh, the, 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 laziness. Um, what I'm going to do, too, is I'm going to go ahead and do probably this panel next. Oh, dear. Oh, it splattered a little bit. Oh, well, that's, there's Photoshop for that. I might try racing them out, too. But luckily, it didn't land in me where it's going to make a mess. It's going to land in the middle of a white of a terrain that I can easily get it out of it. And uh, what I do is I let it dry first before I attempt any erasing because if it's still wet, I could risk smearing it and mashing it with the paper rather than letting it sit. If I let it sit on top of the surface, it might be able to be rinsed out. Man, there's not much. This brush does not want to keep ink in it, which is good. It was, it's just like once you get rid of the ink, it's like, oh, I'm done with the ink and just lets it fall out. Um, which is good, though, because that means it's easier to clean. And it means the, the, the ink flows out of it. It's got a nice flow. Um, I, wish I, <laughs> I wish I'd had uh, the uh, Raphael Company's uh, Twitter. I'd be like, hey, check me out. I'm boasting about your brush. Not trying to be a paid endorsement, but it, you do make a good product, and I'm bragging about it. That's what happens with the Copic demos. I'm not paid by Copic manufacturer or anything like that to make to do a Copic demo. I just do them because I love to teach, kind of. But then I mean, I'm not a teacher. I was almost going to be an art teacher, but then the economy tanked, and I said I'm not going to go for my master's in an economy that's constantly cutting back the arts to make ends meet. Um, which is ironic because then um, one of the things that happened during the during our down economic downturn is. The movie industry did kind of have a little bit of a boom, I would think. I'm sure it probably didn't have a very huge boom. But it seems like the, it seems like we're doing any kind of depression. The entertainment industry does hit a little bit of a slump, but it's not a disastrous slump. Um, uh, in other words, um, one of the things that really went big during the Great Depression, strangely enough, Jigsaw puzzles. There was an entire club of Puzzle of the Week where you'd buy and get a puzzle like you would like a like a subscription service. And which I think is hilarious, because I love jigsaw puzzles and to think getting a jigsaw puzzle by mail every week <laughs> or down at your local newspaper depot or whatever. It's kind of an odd com idea. Um, I love it, you know. So that boomed.
So I think the entertainment industry in general, different pockets of it will get different stuff, but arts usually is the first thing cut. So I said to myself, I'm not going to pursue a master's degree, get myself into, into debt for a degree that's not going to really take me anywhere right now. Um, so I said, I'll put that on hold. So the next best thing I can do is do these art demos, you know? Am I qualified to do an art demo? Who's going to be qualified to be on YouTube anyway? Jeez. That's my response, you know? It's like, um, I do have education. And I enjoy showing what I know. I, am I an expert? <laughs> no. <laughs> do I know some stuff? Yeah, I mean, I know some stuff. Do I know it more than most people? I'd probably say no to that. Do I have experience as an inker? <laughs> yeah. I've inked a comic book before. It's not my own penciling. This is my own penciling. So, you know, am I world's leading expert in the field? Heck no. There's a lot more bigger name people that do what I do, maybe better than I do. I say maybe because I'm pretty sure they do. Um, but then why me? Because why not me? Um, I can still contribute my own way. You don't have to be the best at something to contribute. Just be yourself. Be who you are. So on my own little way, I'm just doing what I can do. Can you? Oh, my big old head's in the way again. I'm sorry, folks. Sorry about that. That was another thing, too. Um, one thing that's been weighing on my mind a lot lately is I don't have a very big audience. I really don't. Um, you look at it, it's like, I don't have very many friends or fans. And it's like, then something weighed in my heart. I felt like God was talking to me, and I heard, don't play to a stadium, play to the room. And I was humbled by that because I started realizing I have an amazing list of people that are my friends, that are my followers on Twitter, that in general just are, are my friends and followers. And I'm like, I don't need 30,000, 20,000, 2,000, even 100 followers. I have an amazing set of people that follow me, and I'm deeply flattered and humbled by that. I have some very talented people that follow me. And if you do follow me, I just want to say thank you um, from the bottom of my heart, seriously. I, sometimes I get depressed and I think, wow, I don't, nobody really looks at my stuff, la, la, la. And again, I, this isn't my profession. This is something I do for fun, and it's a lot of fun. Um, but at the same time, um, it's humbling to see the list of people that follow me, and... I appreciate it uh, uh, from the bottom again from the bottom of my heart. Um, it is incredible to see the people that follow me, and I'm, again, I'm humbled by that every day when I think about it. Um, and it's very special to me. So thank you if you follow me. If you like what I do and you don't say anything about it, I also appreciate it. I don't know that you're doing it, but I appreciate it as well. One of the things I struggle with as an artist is. You know, obviously voice, reach, audience, reach. You know, am I actually saying anything? Am I communicating anything? And I don't know that I need to. Um, if I just keep doing my own thing and no one hears me, I'm still me. That doesn't cease to happen. It's nice to be acknowledged for what I do, but at the same time, if it never happens, what does it matter? I need to express myself. I'm expressing myself. It doesn't matter who's listening. I was talking about that with a friend. You only take, it only takes one person to support you. Luckily, I've got my, my loving wife, who was a supporter of my art even before we were... Were we dating at the time? I forget what would happen, but... I, I had her over at our house, and she didn't even know I did art. And I was like, yeah, here's my painting I did, here's the drawing I did. And she was like, why don't you tell people about this? And I'm like, because I don't really feel like I should. <laughs> like I was like keeping my letter to a bushel, so to speak. And she was like, why are you doing this? Talk about it to people. Let people know what you do. You have beautiful stuff that you do. 
And to this day, if I draw on a napkin, she's like, what are you doing? Uh, I just doodled on a napkin. That's your art. Don't throw it away. She's very protective of my art. And in a good way, um, which I love. And she has been a big supporter of my art. Um, all my, a lot, most of my friends have been big supporters of my art. Um, some, some of my friends on Twitter and Facebook, they're, they're big supporters of my art, too. Um, uh, I have a friend that cosplays in, in uh, Los Angeles kind of area, and she's a big supporter. Well, I don't know if she's a huge supporter of my art, but she's definitely supported it enough where I think she is. Um, and she's been a good friend of my, me and my art and in general. So it's just, I don't like the thinness of that line. I'm going to thicken it up a bit, maybe a bit thicker than I want it to be, but that's okay. It's a shadow side. More of the story is, if it's on the shadow side, it can be thicker. <laughs> um, but um, well, yeah, my, my my friend's been a big supporter of my art. I've got a lot of friends that support my art. I have a friend at work, um, Ashley. I'll I'll, I'll, spare, <laughs> I'll spare her the embarrassment of um, calling her up by name per se. But her, my friend Ashley, she's got a good grasp of, of Alice in the world of Alice in Blizzard, and I will take her step by step through what I'm doing immediately. Like she'll be like, "So what's going on with Allison?" And I'll show her stuff, and she'll be like, "I think that's right. I think that's wrong." And I agree with her. Everything she says is like, everything she says that she's like, "I don't know if that's a good idea. I don't think that fits the, the style of the world." Everything I've said is, and I, and I've, I've had I've second guessed on. Everything I was like, man, I don't know if that's the right thing, is everything she says, that's not right for it. I'm like, you know what? I was on the fence. Because you, you say it's wrong, I now know it's wrong. Because I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> she is incredibly astute in judging what is part of this world and what isn't. And um, it's fun inking draperies with this brush, let me just say. Um, it is extremely fun to ink the draperies with this brush. Uh, I never thought working in a, in a drapery store would pay off. <laughs> so, I mean, like, as I'm inking these things, I'm like, okay, here's the pocket tab, here's the panel, this is where the pole goes through. So, these random things, like, I used to work for a bedding store. No big surprise, I worked for Bed Bath & Beyond there, I said it. And so, um, these things, spending my hours, you know, setting up drapery displays or getting stuff on shelves. These are things that now are paying off in random ways that now I can say, oh, I know how, how, a, how a curtain is constructed. I know how that should look. Um, I know how it should hang. <laughs> so I know all the terminology and I'm not just like scrape, scrambling to go, what is this? What is this supposed to be? What does this mean? I'm like, oh yeah, the hold back, the tie back, the pocket. I don't know exactly what style of drapery I wanted and I'm not like, Okay, what do we want to do for a drape? I'm like, eh, I don't want a tab top. I don't want this. <laughs> so I know like all these things about <laughs> all these things about uh, draperies and fabrics and stuff. And my wife, my wife, my mom. There we go. Uh, my mom was a kind of an amateur seamstress, so I know how to sew too. So, like, I know how fabric works in general. And I'm just, um, it's funny because my wife would be like hem these pants for me, and I'm the one that knows how to use the sewing machine in the family. So I'm like, okay. Because I know, I said, I, with my mom, growing up with my mom, I learned a lot of stuff about fabric in general, how to sew. I made my wife's curtains for her, uh, for a classroom. So, and people are like, how did you get those fun curtains? She's like, went to Walmart, bought the fabric. My, my, my husband made them. Your husband made curtains? Yep, did that on my day off. Kind of like the feathering on that. This, I wasn't sure. It's kind of an even and wobbly on the shoulder strap. There we go. Incidentally, this is like everybody's favorite panel, apparently. Like her her, her, um, her grimace. The ink is almost dried up, too. And while, while, while I use the last of the ink, I'll go ahead and I'll run, do, wash the brush again. Yeah, I need to wash it now. 
But anyway, quick rundown. Basically, in page one, Allison's asleep in bed, and then we pan closer to her eye, and we see her eye opens in terror. Uh, basically, what's going on is she's basically, we're kind of, I use that as a transition to go inside of her mind. So inside of her mind, we see she's falling in Wonderland um, through the rabbit hole. And she lands on page three in a big one-page splash. So she's like crashing to a pile of leaves, and there's a skeleton and everything. So basically, long story short, let me go ahead and see if I can angle the camera up so you can see. Might be able to see it pretty good if I put it up here. Ta-da. There we go. Kind of you can see it right there while I wash the brush. So the upper right panel, which has got the big black box on it, she's kind of rubbing her backside and saying, ow. <laughs> uh, that's literally the only thing that'll be in there. There'll be one bubble, thought bubble, one word bubble, ow, and that'll be it. Second panel, she says something to the effect of, where are we? Or where am I? Sorry, where are we? <laughs> Pluralize something. Where where am I? Third panel will say something like, it's like Wonderland, dot, dot, dot. And then, obviously, you see, she sees the placard that says, where are me? And then the last panel, she says, but whatever happened to cupcakes? <laughs> and it seems like that, that panel where she's like, oh, gosh, you've got to be kidding me this stupid corset. Uh, it seems to be the popular panel <laughs> because she's willing to do it, but she's not going to, like, fly into it. That's kind of Allison. Allison will do what it takes. It may not be what she wants to do, but she'll do what it takes. I think that's a good way of describing Allison Blizzard. She is a, she's gutsy. She's very opinionated. And... But she's also she will kind of bend to the rules to make the to make get by because basically the door won't you know the door opens when she has to shrink through it well basically the door won't open until she's ready to be dressed to see a, a Victorian queen so that's why the Victorian style dress I, that's what I'm using as the reason there's a specific story reason why she I want her in a corset there's an artistic reason that's because I don't want to sit, draw her in a night dress for three you know three to five issues so she'll have the corset at first. And then around the second or third issue, she's going to get a, a jack, a coat for over top of it, and then the Mad Hatter's going to give her a top hat. So it's going to be very specific, like I don't want to say costume changes, but a costume additions, almost in a sense a parody of um, video games. You know how video games you'll have the um, not a tech tree, but you know how you go through a video game and you're like, oh look, you found a hat. Wearing this hat gives you a plus five bonus of your health, and you're like, how does a hat give you a bonus of Okay, never mind. And you just willingly accept it. You grab the hat, you wear it, you move on. Well, that's kind of what it's a parody of. It's kind of a parody of video games where you get these uh, power-ups and equipments that are disguised as clothes. So that's kind of what it's a parody of. But it also keeps me from drawing the same costume over and over again. Um, so it keeps it lively. So it's not like drawing Spider-Man, where you always draw Spider-Man in that red and black suit. You're always drawing the same thing. This way it's at least visually interesting, gives the viewer something else to look at, gives her a couple of modifications, a couple of versions. It's just, I think it's more interesting. Well, look at that. That looks like the ink spattered a bunch earlier today and didn't just land on the page. Um, I might just go ahead and finish up some of the inking on this panel and then call it a, call it a tie. It's almost been two hours. Oh, it's been a little over an hour. But I might keep working if I feel like it. One thing I get bored with is sitting here in silence and ch chatting the whole time. I know my friends would probably hear that and go, you, tired of talking? I'm a very talkative person. I'm also a musician, so I love listening to music, and that's one thing that really gets me down is that I have to... I work in a call center, so I can't listen to music because the call center is silent because we take calls all day long. So I at most get maybe two hours of music daily, an hour, a 30-minute drive-in, two 15-minute breaks, 30 minutes at lunch, and... And... Uh, so 30 minutes at lunch, two 15-minute breaks, and the 30 minutes back and forth to work. So at most, if I'm lucky, I get 30 minutes with me, uh, an hour, and two hours of music at most. And I even shared that on Twitter, too, because I was like, Ugh. it's true. I, again, I don't hate my job. I do. I, 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 it's, sometimes it's unrewarding. Most of the time it's rewarding. Um, I'm not in sales. In other words, I don't force people to buy stuff they don't want. I just give information about something that people already want. So I'm not calling people up. I did kind of ask to be part of the program where you do call people up, but only if the people that I, the people I would be calling have only inquired first, and I'm following back with them to say, hey, here's the information you want. So that interests me. I would love to call people back and say, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so. You called us earlier. We missed your call, but we got your message. So we said, hey, you know what? We'll follow back with what you wanted. You wanted this. Here's your information about that. I like that. I don't mind doing that for call marketing. 
because that means people are very interested in talking to me. And I'd be interested, they'd be interested in talking to me back. So I'm like, okay, I'll do that. That interests me a lot. I don't mind. I mean, I don't mind. I just don't want to be like, hey, do you want to buy this cable service? I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, that'll be the enemy of somebody's lunch, dinner time. But at the same time, uh, the uh, I don't mind calling people that are already interested and have called me first. That interests me, okay. And I don't mind answering the phone for people that call that are interested, but some people just don't want to talk about what they need because they're like, what do you got? And it's like, um, I kind of know what you know what you're looking for. Cause I've got I've got you know 30 different possibilities, but. 29 of them may not need be what you need, and you might not be qualified for 15 of them anyway. So it's kind of one of those jobs where it's like people, some people don't want to talk about stuff, and you're like, talking about it's not your enemy, but some people feel like if they talk about it, they'll be trapped into something I'm going to try to sell them. And I'm not a salesperson. I don't make any commission. I don't make any money off of sales. I get paid by the, by, I don't get even paid by the phone call I take. I get paid by the hour, which means if the phone rings, I make money. The phone doesn't ring, I make money. <laughs> I get money either way, so I don't make anything if you say no to the product. I don't make any money or lose any if you say no to the product. And I think a lot of people think I'm just there to make sales. <laughs> Whether we make, I make a sale or not is inconsequential. I'm there to give it information only. So if the sale happens, the sale happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Of course, the sale doesn't happen unless we talk about the product. So, of course, my okay, good. You can still see. Yeah, good. Um, the sale doesn't happen unless we talk about the product. So, of course, just talking about the product increases sales, which is why I have a job in the first place. Because if we don't talk about this, if we don't talk about it, then you, you never buy the product. But if I talk about the product, you might buy the product. So, my sales are not based on whether you buy the product or not. My I get paid by the dollar an hour because whether you buy the product or not, odds are someone talking about the product will eventually buy it. So I'm not in any kind of pressure to make a sale. I'm not under any pressure to force people to do anything. Maybe demo the product, but the demo is free. All it takes is time, and there's no obligation to buy. So it's like I, I lose nothing. I gain nothing. It's free except for your time. And the only thing I'm supposed to do is say, hey, can we do a demo? And then if they say yes, then we do a demo. And it's again, the demo is free. Um, it just takes your time. And then afterward, you're not, as far as I know, I, I'm not part of the demo process, but you're not pressured into doing anything. And you can even get the demo, even if you tell me right up front, I'm not going to buy. You're still welcome to, because we're not allowed to turn you down. And that's the beautiful thing about it. By law, that's why I tell people, they're like, but uh, I don't want to buy your product. Well, by law, I still have this, well, I, I'm not eligible for your product. By law, I can't tell people, hey, you're not eligible for our product. I can still, I, I'm supposed to say, hey, you know, you still can look at it. You're not, it's free to look, and you can look. Even if you never buy, you can still look. So it's like, it's one of those situations where it's actually better than people think it is. Um, you can see our product even if you have no intention of buying it. So uh, for me, it's a beauty situation. I've got nothing to lose. You've got nothing to lose but your time. And... I don't make any more money. I don't make any less money because of your decision. So, <laughs> and it provides a very basic need for people. So I'm very glad to be in my job. It's really busy, and it's been like I said, sometimes it's only rewarding when people don't want to talk about stuff. But then you get these slow periods where, you know, like, and especially in, in winter time, it's usually you get less customers in, and I'm excited for that because that means Alice and Zombieland will be up and running. And they'll be asking for volunteers to go home, and I'm like, I'll be like, you know what? I'm being paid, you know, 12 bucks an hour to draw my comic. I will stay here and take these phone calls as they come in one at a time. I will take that. <laughs> um, so. That's why a couple days ago when Eve Beauregard did her joke photograph of the of the, the origin of the selfie and she was like, oh, the call center, that's how the selfie comes up. And she did, she took a selfie and then sketched in a, a headset. 
I was like, retweet, because that's like dear to my heart, because I work in a call center. <laughs> I have almost an exact headset you pretend doodled on the page. So I'm like, yeah, that's me every day. So I can. It was hilarious that um, I was like, call center moments, you know? It's like when I watched Julie Julia with, um, what's her name? Uh, Amy Adams. And she's in a call center talking about 9 11 information. I can relate to her because. That's kind of me in a sense. Um, that kind of, you know, talking to call center, living vicariously at night through a hobby. That's kind of me. <laughs> this kind of made to a T. It's like, oh, look at me. I'm drawing comics at night. By day, humble marketing associate. By night, comic book artist. I should, should I make a costume or something? <laughs> kind of awkward. Although I did have an interesting idea for concept for a comic, which I probably could do if I had more time. I came up with a joking title of it and I thought about it. I was like, the title is brilliant. But it's one of those situations that took me a while before I actually execute it. Look at how Allison's turning out. By the way, Allison is supposed to be um, the face of Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Um, not specifically. In other words, what happened was this. Let me go over that, that one, one piece at a time. I worked on developing our face. I couldn't think of the exact face. I sketched it out, and finally I got the right look for it. I'm like, that is perfect. A couple days later, I had it, after I had it nailed down, I was watching Scott Pilgrim, and I was like, that's the face. The whole time I was trying to sketch Mary Elizabeth Winston, and I didn't even know. And then afterwards, I realized I was sketching her, and then I was like, oh, okay. So now I use her as the... I use her as kind of the, the model without being exactly... like If it doesn't look exactly like Mary Elizabeth Winstead, I don't redraw it. But that's kind of my aim, is to aim for her, her appearance. Like, if I were to make, if this were to be made into a movie, I would want Mary Elizabeth Winstead to play Allison. Seriously. Like, I'm seriously, part of me wants to get, rush this to get done, to get this well out, you know, not like, oh, I want to get this done in 10 years' time. No, I want to get it done while Mary Elizabeth Winstead's still young and has the potential to play Allison. I mean, like, literally, that's out of my mind. Um, it's a dream. It probably would never happen. But my gosh, would it have been <laughs> Um, man, I got a lot of this done. What I'm going to do on this is, um, for the bottom part, I mean, obviously I'm going to ink this with, with pen and ruler, and I might do this part with a nib, because it's really kind of scraggly, and a nib will give you really kind of an interesting line on that. Um, let me go ahead and do the... What do I want to do next? I'm trying to decide what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in doing. I might go ahead and do this middle panel here because it's kind of boring to do this. Because I mean, the, the 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 idea of the panel is, is it's the same kind of. Oops. Oh, too far away. <laughs> Let me just do this. The panels here, one, two, three, are uh, they're not exact copies of each other. If you notice, the camera slowly pans over. Um, at first, we'd see another corset, so the camera's kind of slowly doing this. On this, and this one here, we're, we're like this. The camera's here, looking at Allison like this. The next one is looking more like this. And the third one's looking more like this. So the camera is slightly moving until we get to be behind her. But the whole idea is you can't, I, I would never be, uh, the camera's constantly on her her left side if her back is towards us. So as you notice, here she's turned, she's facing us, so we're, the camera's on the right side. The camera doesn't move, but she rotates around. And even as she rotates around and looks at the corset uh, in this panel, we're still on this right side of her. She's just turned around. I mean, we're just behind, and we just moved behind her so that the next panel should be out. It'll be an overshot. You know, we're looking over her shoulder to the rabbit beyond on the floor. So I haven't moved the camera. The camera is constantly. This is a storytelling thing. The camera. This is Allison. This is the camera. The camera has moved. Here's basically this is Allison. The camera. The corset area right here. The camera is looking like this the whole time. The minute she looks at the corset, the camera does this. So now that they were behind her, but we're still looking on the same side. So now when we look over her shoulder, we're actually over here more. I mean, let me move it so the camera can see it. So now the camera's over here for this, for this panel right here. 
So now we're on this angle, and we'll see the rabbit beyond, but we're still at this angle. Now when she, we, we see her from above, looking at the rabbit, our camera moves back to here and does an upshot. But we're still on this side. So Allison's going to be looking up and away this way, towards this way, um, away from us, because the camera's going to be here. Well, actually, I kind of do this. <laughs> it's not, but it makes more sense for the, for the story. I still have gone over to this side. You don't want to shoot Allison from this side over here. You can't see because of the cup. Um, you don't want to shoot Allison completely from this side. I kind of do it from here. You don't want to be on this side without proper explanation because it's called breaking the 180 rule. Basically, you have a camera, a plane, or say a character, plane. Now, you can either, you, every time you have to be on this side, unless the camera, the person, person rotates, uh, so the person's here and then turns, you can, it would look like they broke the rule, but you have to make sure that it's clear that they turned. So that's why I have all these panels describing Allison's kind of turn back and forth. So that the viewer's not like, oh, why am I all of a sudden on a different side from Allison? La la la. So uh, you want to be able to cue the art, the the. We have, in movies, it's a little bit it's a little bit easier to, to forgive the rules because you'll have a camera motion that will help with it. But you don't have camera motion in a comic book. You have still frames, and so you have to kind of spoon feed the audiences to where you are. Because I've seen some panels where I'm like, wait, how did we get here? Is this the future? Is this, oh, okay, did this. So you really have to kind of be, oh, you just see my hand, I'm sorry. I'm cleaning the brush, twisting it through the paper towels. I put some brush up in it. I put some water in it, twisting it, keeping it, helping keep it shape as I do that. I used to get to show these minor things. I, I'm like, I showed them to you before, but I should show them every time. So when I wash the brush, I dip it in some water. I get some of the water off of it, and then I do this. I twist the brush, and I dry it off, so it keeps that nice point at the end of it. Um, I might just go ahead and kind of noodle around on that panel, and then call it an afternoon, just because I don't want a long video. I think YouTube caps the videos at two hours anyway. No, four hours I think it is, but I don't think anybody wants to watch a four-hour demo of me inking. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, I'll probably work on this panel here. I've done everything in this panel that does, is, doesn't involve pen and ink, like a pen and the uh, not pen and ink, but a pen and a ruler. So everything here is now pen and ruler. Um, everything on this now is pen ruler or uh, quill nib. So I'm going to do everything that needs to be done with brush work on this page and then go on to the other things. Because I can do the brush, I can do the pen and the ruler stuff at work because all I do is I cap a pen, draw a line, if a phone call comes in, I cap the pen, put the ruler aside, answer the phone. Brush is a little bit harder because, you know, if the phone rings, I can't just go, oh, let me go ahead and put my, wash my brush out first, folks, while I'm supposed to be answering the phone. So, yeah, that's a little bit trickier. Interestingly enough, on a side note, body type. I don't like talking about body types. It makes it seem like I'm being sexist or something or weird, but as an artist, I know I can talk about it a little bit without people being completely weirded out. I really seriously thought about what kind of body type Allison would have, like what her build would be. Um, I don't want her to be... My goal is not to draw somebody that's a size C or D um, bra, you know, bra, you know, bust line. I didn't want to have a, a, a C cup or a D cup. I just everybody in comics seems to have this gigantic uh, bus line. Same with the guys. The guys are all super ripped. And that's what brought up an idea for a comic I came up with. I was like, wouldn't it be funny to do a comic about this really pudgy guy with a beard? <laughs> I just I just thought it would be hilarious. Um, a really tall, thin Hispanic woman and this short pudgy guy with a beard. Um, that was my comic that I was like, I can make a com I can make a comic book out of that. Um, I don't know if they're crime fighters or not, but this is something I came up with when I was out with my wife one day. And it, it seems like it's such a good idea. I just don't have time to, to develop it. <laughs> um, I just thought it was weird to have a six foot tall Hispanic woman. Most Hispanic women are kind of short, but I just thought it'd be funny to have this like, you know, really tall, and this short, pudgy, kind of lovable guy with a beard. Um, but anyway, um, long story short, I don't want Allison to be some buxom blonde, you know, some, not that everybody has, you know, everybody's, everyone that's, you know, C cup or D cup is, is a bimbo. No, 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 not at all. But I just get tired of seeing that same body type over and over again. In fact, when searching for stuff to make the proper body type for Allison, 
all I could find, except if I go to ballet dancer photographs, you know, <laughs> is um, these really curvy women. Um, and I, I picture Alice as being this kind of thinner, wirier, not really chesty woman. And I couldn't find anybody that matched the body type I wanted. And then I stumbled across a picture of um, Christina Applegate. And I was like, that's the body frame. Wider shoulders, thinner shoulders. I mean, she's not un, she's not unfeminine, but wider frame, flatter, um, just all around flatter. I mean, there's a picture of, of her that I have on my desktop to remind myself of the body type. It's really hard to find reference photos for that body type, just saying. It seems like we emphasize so much about the busty um, you know, the five foot three, five foot six, C cup, you know, 130 pounds, and it's like, that's not what I envision Alice to be. I envision Alice to be about 5'10, maybe 6 even, kind of wiry, not boyish, but certainly not Victoria's Secret in doubt either. And it's really hard. So sometimes if, if she looks like she's not what I've just described, it's probably because I couldn't find reference photos for it, and I just fail at drawing smaller chested women because there's no real references for it. I'm sure there are, but finding them is hard because most everybody emphasizes that C, D cup body type. And it's such a shame because I'm trying to diversify with, with Allison. You know, something that's, you know, not unfeminine, but not overly sexual either, and that's kind of the goal with Allison, this kind of more more than just the body kind of character. It's, it's a passion of mine is to kind of get some more interesting characters, more well-developed characters. I was going to say well-rounded, but that's kind of like a bad pun. That's exactly what I want. I want a more, you know, well, well-thought-out character. And I'm not going to be, I'm not dissing stuff like, say, um, oh, what's the name of that comic? Uh, what is it? I can't think of it off the top of my head. Empowered? Because I was like, oh, Empowered, that's kind of like exactly the opposite of what I want to do. But if you read his comic, Empowered, it's literally the buxom blonde. Um, but it's doing it to be a parody of the stereotype. So he's making fun of how that stereotype, because I didn't think it was possible to do it, and I read some pages from it, and I was like, oh my gosh, it really is a parody of that stereotype of the eye candy superheroine, um, which is exactly the opposite of what I do, is the eye candy stereotype heroine. I, wanted, I don't want to be ugly, I want her to be beautiful, but that's not, uh, uh, that's why I like Terry Dodson's Wonder Woman, because Terry Dodson's Wonder Woman is beautiful, but it's not like the feature. It's like, she's a strong warrior, and oh yeah, she happens to be beautiful. He finds that accurate balance between beauty and strength, which is, of course, essential with Wonder Woman. And I think people draw some amazing Wonder Women. Wonder Women? Can I say plural in that case? Um, but I think Terry Dodson's my favorite Wonder Woman artist because he just... I mean, Adam Hughes does too. Adam Hughes does a really kick butt. Glamorous, but still still beautiful Wonder Woman, and yet still also very ma very strong and muscular. And he just did a, a colored, he just did a, a commissioned Wonder Woman, and you're like, wow, she's beautiful, and she's got a massive, massive set of muscles. I mean, she looks like she could be a WWE wrestler, but at the same token, she's also, like, not ugly. Um, so he did an amazing job of making a very muscularly toned Wonder Woman that also doesn't look unfeminine. Um, but at, Terry Dodson has got a very amazing Wonder Woman drawings. And that's why I, I read Love and Murder, because I knew he had done some pages in it. And let me just say the pages he did and, and the page, artist after him were fantastic. Although Terry Dodson did a much better job in his pages. Just saying, I'm a big fan of Terry Dodson. I wish I could meet him, but since he's primarily West Coast, I probably won't get a chance to meet him. I would love to have a commissioned piece of art from him. Um, however, Good art costs money, and I'm a starving artist myself, so I probably won't get one. Um, but Terry Dodson is just incredible. Um, I love his stuff. I love this brush. This brush really is nice. It might be just because it's a new brush and you can tell. When I actually care to get the line right, the brush gives me what I want, and that's everything you want. Because you can't force something... Well... I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to boast about my own pencils because I think I suck as a penciler. 
<laughs> I'm still learning. I can draw. I know I can draw. It's not humility that keeps me from saying I'm not a good penciler. It's the fact that there's a difference between drawing and penciling. Penciling is drawing a character. Drawing in general is just the art of picking up a pencil and sketching what you see. Penciling is making a graphic impact with an image, not just capturing what's on the what's in front of you. And that's something I'm struggling to learn every day with Allison. Uh, for example, I think this page is a better page than the page before. And the page before that was the better page before the other one. In fact, even somebody that did a portfolio critique of my own at HeroesCon, who I'll remain nameless because I'm not trying to say, oh, he endorses my art. He doesn't. He just did a portfolio critique. And even he says, wow, big improvement between pages two and three. And I said, yeah, page two was the done last two weeks. Page one was done months ago. <laughs> he goes, well, you can tell your storytelling has improved. I was like, okay, that's the goal. Every page should be better than the last one. And I love it when artists share these pages. Uh, where they show, this is where I was five years ago. This is where I am now. It's funny because you always think of like artists like Adam Hughes, um, that like, they always were like flawless. And you look at some of Adam Hughes' stuff, it looks like typical 80s art. And I'm not trying to say anything bad because it's, it's fun. But at the same time, he, he's grown so much. Um, hold on a second, guys. Right, besides the ring or else I will be in pr trouble because I'll... Give me for copyright violation for music. Hey. Hey, honey. What's up? I'm in the parking lot. I'm waiting for the air and the kick in and stuff. So I'm far go, but I should be home. It's so traffic. I should be home before four. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, I'll, I'll have an editing report job. Just, just make sure you make a side of it. Yeah, I'll do that. It doesn't have to be ready when you come back, does it? Yeah I, can do, what's that, yeah, I can probably try to do that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to wait for this to be so hot outside. I'm going to wait for this to kick in, and then I should be home for 4-4, okay? Sounds good. All right. Love you. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Randomness. My wife called. So, um, I'll be getting off shortly. Um, not immediately, but shortly. Um, just because I have to get dinner ready. Um, <laughs> the life, glamorous life of an artist. I have to get my, I have to get dinner ready. Well, I don't have to get dinner ready. I just have to get the stuff prepared so she can, we can make it together. But um, yeah, you learn, you get better, you improve. And always keep working. You will get better. Do not lose heart. You will get better. Um, just keep working hard. Keep producing. The main thing is to keep working. Just keep working and you'll get better. Actually, not just keep working, but keep working to get better. Because if you keep working and you don't try to improve yourself, you'll always be the same you were. And you don't want to do that. You want to be... Um, better than that. You want to be amazing. So keep pushing yourself to be amazing and you will one day become more amazing. I'm going to stop here, guys, uh, because it's a good stopping point. My brush was dirty. Um, now, I might work on it tonight off camera. Um, I'm kind of glad of where I got so far. When I get the fourth page done, I'm going to probably share it with some artists, the comic, an artist I told them I'd share it with her. Um, let me show the page again. There we go. Is that too low? No, there we go. So, um, there we have it. A lot of this I'll probably do off camera. I'll probably save, if I do a live ending demo next month, next month, <laughs> next week, I hope, um, I'll probably do the other page, the one with the zombie rabbit on it. Well, it's not really a zombie rabbit. It's more of a carnivorous rabbit that the, the Red Queen, Queen of Hearts, is controlling. Um, so, yeah, um, that's the page, kind of in progress. And, oh. Uh, like I said, I might, this page might be done by the time I get back to my odd demos next week. So I'm going to try to do one next week. 
I've kind of missed this a lot, um, just in general. I've had to get my glasses last two weeks ago, my new ones, <laughs> which I think looked a lot better than my old ones, and they're obviously newer prescription. And I've, ha I've had a lot of stuff to do um, in general, just personal stuff, surgeries and things that I need to get done during the summer. Well, minor surgeries. Um, oh, let me show you Allison. If you guys don't know Allison, um, this is Allison, my character. And also, okay, good demo for what my, my links are. Yeah, 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 here we go. But that's Allison, like, inner corset. Um, these are business cards I made. <laughs> these are the test strips. But I mean, Allison has my, my, all my contact info on it, which is just Jason Enos Comic Art on Facebook. Just Jason Enos, J-A-S-O-N-E-N-O-S. Um, Echo November Oscar Samuel. <laughs> Jason Eno's comic art. Um, I'm also at Allison Zombieland comic. Uh, I said uh, I didn't know there was an Allison Zombieland when I created the name of the title. I didn't know there was a book, a movie. I didn't Google it first. You should always probably Google something first. And I was creating the Facebook and I'm like, why is this taken already? Because somebody else had the brilliant idea using the same name. But that's why it's Allison, not Alice, because it's a different character. Um, and also Bauer Power 24777. Bauer B-A-U-E-R, like Jack Bauer. Power, because Jack Bauer is strong. 24, because that's the show. And 777. Um, that's my deviant art name. And, of course, on, on Twitter, it's Enos the Composer. Um, like I said, just um, I'll be posting new links about oh, I'll do another inking demo. Thank you for tuning in. I know one guy was, somebody tuned in. I don't know who you were, <laughs> but I did see somebody. And the thing is, I've been told that four or five people said, oh, yeah, I watched it live. And it only showed me, like, one or two viewers. And people have told me, oh, I had, you know, I had like, five viewers. I've never seen viewership up to like five people. So Google doesn't show me everybody. So if you're watching me at this time live, I don't see you, and hi. Uh, and if you're watching this after the fact, hi too. <laughs> um, because this will record and save my YouTube channel. And I really appreciate, uh, even if you don't say anything to the video, if you watched it a little bit, thank you. If you liked it, extra thank you. Um, but I'll be doing some more live inking demos. I might do a live Copic demo again. I might need some more markers before I do that. Yeah, I might need to get some more refills of certain colors. And the Eve Beauregard piece that I did, the Catwoman that I did last demo, kind of taught me I need new Copic refills. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching this, if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube. And I'll see you guys for another demo coming up here pretty soon.